Um, thank you for listening to me again. A um, couple questions. Anybody out there who's a diver, recreational diver? Okay. Does anybody have any experience in the public safety community, either as a medical director or a volunteer fireman? Okay. Anybody hang around a firehouse, hang around with firemen, policemen? Okay. They eat well, don't they? Yeah. There's a point to that. Okay. <clears throat> when I was asked to take over the uh, being medical director for this public safety organization, um, I thought that, that's great. And then they tasked me with, well, why are our public safety divers dying? Well, just like the Dan data, there's lots of reasons, entrapment, gas management. But when you start digging into the data, the number one cause is heart disease. And so that's where we're going today with this, because this is where we're getting pushback, or did get pushback, uh, much to the credit of the UHMS. Uh, the task force that was sort of a subset of other groups designed to look at this, in fact, came to the same conclusion. It came down with some rather strong recommendations. What's interesting when you get this data out is that the implications for the public safety dive community carry over to implications to all of us who are over the age of 25 or 30, and those of us who dive, and those of us who participate in vigorous activity. So let me just start going through some things, um, and we'll try and have some gee whiz pictures. Please understand that cardiac fitness, cardiac screening, those topics take up entire symposiums for multiple days at cardiology conferences. So I'm condensing 60 or 80 hours of talking to 20 minutes. So you're going to get it all here in 20 minutes, all right? So let's talk about cardiac screening and diving in general. So what makes divers die? Well, let's review cardiac anatomy. My, this is my wheelhouse. I like this stuff. Okay, here's a nice normal coronary angiogram. You'll notice nice, smooth, tapering vessels. Looks like a perfectly new canal here in South Florida, LAD diagonal, um, but really nice vessels. Gradual tapering, nice arborization branches coming off. Let's hope we all look like that. Here's a, somebody's not doing so well. Focal narrowing, small branch and pruning, uh, irregular walls, focal narrowing there. Not stuff, not bad stuff. Or not good stuff. Now, why do people have heart attacks? Well, back when I was a student and as a resident back in the dark ages, you know, it was a tight stenosis, no blood supply, infarct, easy. Except, of course, nothing's easy. In fact, most likely the thing that gets you is that unstable plaque, right? It's not necessarily the 80% stenosis. It's the 30% stenosis that then ruptured. And that probably is causing your acute heart attack. Let's go through that for a moment. So what I'm talking about is an atherosclerotic or atherogenic plaque in the coronary. For one reason or another, this fibrous cap breaks, and the platelets and the fibrinous material break out, much like a little teeny volcano. It goes downstream, stimulates that endothelium and platelet function, and you have a clot. And there you see uh, a non-fatal heart attack with a little break in the cap. Here's your atho atherogenic plaque. This is the coronary wall. This is your narrowing. And you have a little maybe break there, but that's pretty nice looking uh, stenosis compared to this one. This was a fatal heart attack where you actually see the break in that cap. Here's your atherogenic plaque. Here's the break. And then this stimulated a clot when that thing ruptured, causing an acute coronary thrombosis and a fatal heart attack. So it's that plaque rupture that does that to us. And what causes plaque rupture? Well, what causes this instability? Well, stressful factors. High catecholamine levels, uh, maybe exercise, maybe a fast heart rate, maybe hypoxia, a bunch of things all interacting. But I think you understand it's a concept of physical stress. OK, I think we would agree on that. So just to show you what a plaque rupture looks like in a macro picture, this is a carotid I was doing. This fellow had, had an acute stroke. And this was the indication for this was a uh, stroke in progress. So here you see a normal end of the artery, proximal. Here's the internal. And here you see, it was a wonderful picture of this discoloration and hematoma and bleeding within the plaque itself, which caused this carotid problem. Okay. I'm sorry? No. Oh, OK. Anyway, looking at coronaries, here we go. Uh, nice picture of thrombus within it, and you can get the picture there. And we also know in risk factors, which we all have to one degree or another, um, as you increase blood pressure, hypertension, cholesterol, 
bad cholesterol, diabetes, cigarettes, there's your mortality rate, infarct rate going up, estimated 10 years. I mean, that, that's obvious, we all know that. And of course, when we're evaluating American adults, any of us, it is not a question of whether or not one has coronary disease or vascular disease. Okay, that's a painful fact to hear, but I think we all understand that, right? We all have atherogenic plaques and streaking in our arteries. So the question then is, who is at risk from how much disease as opposed to who has disease? Because we're all there. So the mature heart, some of us are more mature than others out there, which is not the same thing as age, but in this case we'll call it the same thing. Um, not good news, when uh, you get older, your peak heart rate drops, which means your total cardiac output drops because you cannot beat as fast. Compliance drops off a little bit, myocardial elasticity, so your ability to manage volume overload. And what happens when we jump in the water, we're in that water column? Anybody? We're in, we go to zero G, so what happens to our venous return? Increases about 500, 600 cc's within about 10 seconds, a little bit of volume overload. So for most of us, that's no problem, but if you had somebody who was had an injection fraction of 15 percent and was a potential transplant candidate, you know, they would not be able to necessarily handle that real quick volume over. And arrhythmias, of course, atrial fibrillation, parasystoles as we get older. And that's bad news. But wait, it gets worse, okay? <laughs> um, our recovery rate slows, okay? We cannot go out and then do something strenuous and come back and do it hard the next day. Those of us who are still fooling ourselves that we can still do century rides and we compete in triathlons. In fact, we just can't train as hard. That, that's just the reality of it is. It, it takes longer. No Tour de France for you either, okay? Because now your maximum VO2 is dropping off. So you're not gonna be able to put out 500 watts for 30 minutes like Lance Armstrong. You'll be lucky to put out you know, 200 watts for 10 minutes. Okay, so that sort of sucks. And of course, risk of coronary disease goes up, or more importantly, the risk of symptomatic functional coronary disease. <clears throat> and being in shape is no good, nor is no guarantee either. Two very famous incidences, Jim Fix, The Book of Running, and then Ed Burke, who was the cycling physiologist who supported the US cycling team. Both superb athletes, both influenced hundreds of thousands of Americans to go out and get exercise. Both of them died suddenly from acute coronary events while exercising. So now, do I have your attention how bad things are? In fact, we're all screwed, might as well just go home. because it's not good. So, okay, it's, it's bad news out there. So now you take public safety divers, firemen, policemen, and they sit around, and I've been there in the firehouse with them, done research with them, great guys, and many of my dearest friends are firemen. And they eat well, they cook for themselves. And I personally have been with them in the fire truck when we leave the firehouse and sign out, we go down to Whitey's ice cream because Saturday night, let's have some ice cream, okay? So you tell them that they have to exercise on the job. Some of them are really into that and are, do, do that, and they take care of themselves. But many others are going, no, well, I'm not going to do that. I, that's not why I have this job, you know. So, you know, we have some, risk, some high-risk people in the community. <clears throat> this was a fireman rescue diver in Michigan. They have an outstanding team, and they actually put their team through a physical test every six months to make sure everybody's up to speed. And this guy had, in fact, had a coronary stent uh, some years ago. There says right coronary stent. Otherwise feeling fine. On this particular day, he took the swimming test and didn't feel well. So he took, stopped. So then about an hour later, he felt better. Thought he'd attempt the swimming test again. He was about you know, two minutes into the test, he collapsed in the water, immediately brought out, resuscitated, and died in a post-mortem exam. We, oops, excuse me. We see that in spite of what was thought to be an asymptomatic patient, there's his stenosis up and down everywhere, plus his old infarcts, okay? And he was unable to complete this watermanship test. We'll get to that, which then will lead us into Pete's discussion of military diving and fitness to dive. But the point being is that the disease can be hidden, it can be subtle, in this case it's extensive. And up until he actually was stressed, 
until he underwent a, a type of a functional stress test that was not discovered. Okay. Now, so essentially, he was asymptomatic until it mattered. All right. Now, asymptomatic is really important here in this work. I want you to follow with me. So we have the asymptomatic person. So the problem is, how do we screen? Who do we screen? When do we screen them? How often do we screen them? What are the costs? You know, you've heard these talks before, and you're, you'll glaze over when we talk about sensitivity and specificity. But screening of sedentary individuals, uh, we, uh, we know that when people start exercising, they're at increased risk because they've not upregulated their system in a general sense to manage that, okay? So talking about screening, let's look at the big picture. The uh, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, which anybody ever looked at what that is? We see this all the time. They just came out with the PSA recommendation last month. Okay, do you might know the makeup of the group? Okay, this is 17 physicians, general practitioners, who are appointed to make these decisions. They look at all the data, they come out with a recommendation. That's it. So in, in thoracic surgery, we laugh and call that bog sat. Okay, that's a bunch of guys sitting around a table. Okay, and it, the data gets you a little bit nervous sometimes. But let's look at this and see what they say. In the asymptomatic adult, there's an extremely low rate of cardiac problems, and it's impractical, and it's especially not useful in those people undergoing moderate intensity exercise. Pay attention to the word moderate. That seems very reasonable, moderate exercise, but what is moderate exercise? Is it recreational diving? Is it being a fireman? Is it being a SEAL? You know, what is that? Because that gets very problematic. Well, when you look at the American College of Sports Medicine special communication on this, they talked about the asymptomatic patient, and sort of came along the same guidelines. You know, for the asymptomatic, moderate exercise person, you don't need a stress test. Okay, and that seems reasonable. And for the symptomatic patient, that you do. But they slip in here in the bottom, bottom. This is particularly necessary, right, not only with chronic disease, or in somebody who's going to have vigorous intensity exercise. Okay, now if you just glance over both these statements, you're kind of thinking, okay, we don't need to scream, we don't need to do stress tests. But wait, drill down here, okay? We're talking about vigor. Somehow we went from moderate to maybe vigorous is slipping in here. So at the fatality conference in Duke, which is one of the best meetings I've ever been to, uh, Pamela Douglas uh, from cardiology there helped, us, helped the UHMS write a paper. And it pointed out that if you're gonna train somebody if you're going to look at exercise programs and stress testing, it needs to be very sport specific because in this group of people who are out doing activities, they have a limited ability to recognize and respond to an emergency. Um, I know that when I get out and I run, you know, God, I have chest pain in the first minute, you know. <laughs> I just, it, it sucks, you know, it's no fun. But the point of that, I'm trying to make light of is you have a master's athlete who's competing in track or swimming or you have somebody who's doing a vigorous activity because they have to or want to or they're competing, when you are getting near the end of your stress where you are very tired and you're breathing hard and you're working hard, you may not notice that subtle change where now all of a sudden that cramp in your side may be anginal now. Maybe it's not just a diaphragmatic irritation. Or maybe I'm a little more stressed here than I thought or, man, that was a hard dive. You know, so in certain settings, people will not respond appropriately, okay? Because let's face it, not everybody is sitting on the couch and all of a sudden they have left arm pain radiating to the jaw, okay? Myocardial disease, coronary disease, ischemic disease has many different presentations. So let's look at this. This is a, a kind of a fun thing. Has anybody been watching the Olympics? If you notice they have a warm-up pool and a warm-up track? Okay, very, very important. And if you look at a lot of the track athletes, even the sprinters, they will come in and they're just drenched in sweat when they get to the starting line. Because they've been working, up for, working out for about 40 minutes before they get to the start line. Why do they do that? They've got a race, but they're working out hard. And the swimmers have a great warm-up pool. And remember Missy Franklin last week was seen warming up between her vents 10 minutes. She never allowed herself to stop working, did she, in that entire evening, which is a remarkable thing. Why is that? That's called VO2 on kinetics. Anybody heard of that? Okay, so what happens is that we go from sedentary 
right here, zero time. And this is our oxygen per uh, body weight consumption. And right here, if I just ask you to stand up and sprint to the bar, as motivated as you would be to get to the bar, if you're sprinting very, very hard, you know, you're going to be a little bit out of breath. But if you were to spend 10, 15 minutes warming up for it, in fact, you've switched your aerobic and your anaerobic relationship, and now you are able to extract oxygen better. Your aerobic function is better. And that's called VO2 on kinetics. Okay. And in fact, if you look at elite athletes and people like us, which are very different, there's four time constants here. But the average person takes about 40 to 160 seconds to kind of start the switch, start your ignition switch. Unhealthy subjects take about 90 seconds. The elite athletes can do it in about 10 to 15 seconds. So the Missy Franklin, as long as she kept herself warm, even for the 200 meter race, when she hit that starting block, in the first 10 seconds, she was already back to maximal oxygen consumption. Guarantee you and I cannot do that in 10 seconds. Okay. How do you get there? That's the only way, endurance training. Even the sprinters do endurance training just for this reason. So going back to our diver who died, okay, <clears throat> we see there that uh, he, in fact, was never able to ramp up his VO2 on kinetics. He flunked that swim test. He was unable to, and that was a warning sign that somebody should have picked up on it. In some senses, the stress test or this watermanship test functioned perfectly because it screened him. He flunked, didn't he? What had happened was he tried it again. Okay, so the, the test was good. The test was valid. He wasn't. So he was tired, unable to compete. Didn't have any chest pain, though. Never complained of the chest pain. So when we're looking at this, again, from the, uh, this is a circulation 2001. We realize these burst type activities can be very, very stressful to the master's level athlete, which is most of us. So now we talked about triggering events and events underwater. So now you imagine this, your myocardial chest pain. Now imagine it at 30 feet with zero visibility. You're exerting yourself. Your regulator now is at oxygen, maximum oxygen, uh, gas demand. You're breathing hard. You're working. You're trying to do some task underwater. And now you have this. Does it make sense or seem reasonable that this is either a triggering event or a disabling injury? Well, certainly it is. Okay. I submit to you that if you had this problem underwater, you would be in a real problem. Now, has anybody ever looked at things like electrocutions? Ever seen already think forensic pathology there? Often when you see somebody's electrocuted, you will find that the source of the current was the wall current. And the body is found oh, over here somewhere. Why would that be? Wasn't that the wall current has so much power that it blew them away, which happens with those big power stations? Well, you put your, anybody stick your finger in a light socket? Ever done that? I have. Okay. It's, you go, ow. Stick it in, you fibrillate. You go, oh, man, what's your reflex? You walk away and you collapse. Because if you fibrillate, you've probably got about 10 seconds of useful consciousness before the perfusion pressure in your brain drops off and now you have no functional, no meaningful functional capacity. And that's typically what happens in household electrocutions. And in somebody who's getting ready to fibrillate, they've only got about 10, once they do, they've got about 10 seconds to react. And 10 seconds underwater is a long time because, or I should say not very long, because nobody will get to you. You don't have time to signal. Nobody will find you. So you've got a problem which may be salvageable if you were to collapse in, say, uh, the runway, or excuse me, the um, concourse at O'Hare Airport, where they have AEDs about every 100 feet, whereas underwater, it's just not going to be a good, good situation. So when we go back and look at that task force, we know that uh, exercise testing is not recommended for the general population. For those of you who are divers, you are not the general population. You may not extrapolate the task force findings to what you do or to the divers that you take care of or what you're asking those people to do. So put away all that general stuff because it has nothing to do with you and diving medicine. 
what's our problem here in America? Well, there you go. I love these numbers. They're just so much fun. I had to share them. So the double gulp from 7-Eleven, that's 600 calories right there. And that wonderful high fructose corn syrup. There we go. This is the Heart Attack Grill in Chandler, Arizona. They have a famous burger. And it sort of gets a lot of buzz and stuff. They have a, a associate restaurant in Las Vegas where they just had a death, actually. And I, I, can assure, I, I can assure you that's not the cause of death. OK. Although, well, for most people, it's not the cause of death. This, however, is the cause of death. OK. And uh, there's people who eat that. And those are the numbers. And nutritionists, not me, figured that out. OK. So anybody want to man up, see if you can do it? OK. So uh, they, they, have a, they have a deal. And this, this talk about, you know, there's no such thing as bad publicity, just spell my name right. So their deal is, is that if you can eat this, it's free. Have at it. OK. Well, in Las Vegas, about well, six months ago, a guy did eat it. And he got it free. Well, and then he collapsed from his MI, really. And he died right there in the restaurant. But they gave it to him for free. But it was great publicity. <laughs> and I'm not making it up. OK, so let's talk about moderate and vigorous exercise. I'm getting near the end. And what does that really mean? Well, when the task force talks about moderate, this is what they're talking about. Oops, I'm sorry. Three miles per hour is about 3.3 mets. Leisurely swimming is about six mets. So you get in, splash around, about six mets. OK, what is six mets, really? Basically, brisk walking. Anybody take care of truck drivers? Anybody pass anybody a physical for a truck driver? Department of Transportation mandates that a truck driver be able to reach six mets. OK, so you can be able to do, do a brisk walk. And if you can walk briskly for about five minutes, you too can be a truck driver. OK, so it's not very much. If you look at the truck drivers I see on the road, OK, they're not exactly heading off to London this year. OK, vigorous running, um, a 12-minute mile, 8 mets. Swimming hard, 8 to 11 mets. Bicycling, 15 miles an hour. 15 miles an hour really, I don't know, it isn't all that hard. OK, so at least for most people. So that's what they mean by vigorous, OK? But what do we mean when we talk about people who have special jobs like public safety divers or coming up the military divers? Okay, I'm submit to you that vigorous, this vigorous, is entry level for those people who have to perform at the elite athlete level, rescue level, extreme workload level. Okay. <clears throat> Look at stress testing. We have some great insights from this. I would highly recommend. Uh, this, one, this is from the ACSM, American College of Sports Medicine, uh, certified news. Great insight here for those of you who don't do cardiology. Um, ST segment changes, of course, are important. Chronotropic incompetence. If you don't recover quickly, okay, you have two times the risk of a cart myocardial event. Excuse me. If you just um, if you don't ramp up quickly, it's two times. If you don't recover, it's two point six. If you have abnormal exercise capacity less than five mets, you have a five times incidence of a coronary event. Okay, so exercise capacity seems to be a very important thing. And I, that basically, you just heard the punchline to the lecture as we go along. That's it. So additionally, absolute exercise capacity decreases your risk. Every minute you can get on the trail, every minute you run past your initial goal, you, that tells you that you have an 8% less risk. Okay, so exercise capacity, your ability to do so, probably is more sensitive indicator of your coronary health than any other thing that we have that's reasonable to do other than cardiac catheterization. So two big insights from this. The presence or absence of symptoms is a relatively weak indicator of coronary health myocardial health, which is why the um, RTSC physical that Chris alluded to is really not very valuable because it doesn't matter if you have symptoms or it doesn't matter if you don't have symptoms. Functional, oh, excuse me again, functional capacity rules. In fact, it has a better correlation than the Framingham data. Has anybody been on the Framingham score? Okay, do you realize that the Framingham screening is free? That you can just get online? 
and put in your risk factors, and it'll punch up what your risk of coronary disease is. I would urge all of you to do it. It's very enlightening. It's cholesterol, body weight, age, a few things, you know. Yeah, okay. And then in spite of all the data we have on Framingham, because if you've, I say Framingham, I'm sorry for those in, from Connecticut. Um, if you look at that data, we've been discussing that now for a whole generation of physicians, right, because that's our longitudinal study run in Framingham, Connecticut. And yet, functional capacity is more value in deciding what's going on. So why workload matters? Well, six months, six METs is good for most occupational things. But for people who have real risky jobs in terms of performance, you need to be in that 12 to 13 range. Now, this 13 METs gets to be unfun. OK, you start working hard. And so here's, what does this mean in terms of 13 METs and various swimming tests? Well, here's something probably you may be familiar with. The NFPA 99 and the Dive Rescue Group have a uh, watermanship test of which you have to swim 500 yards in less than 10 minutes for your maximum points. That's way better than passing. Yeah. If you look at the US Coast Guard Swimmer School, 500 yards in less than 12 minutes to get into it to see if you're a candidate. For, correct me if I'm wrong here, Pete, but this is the data I get. Uh, SEAL training to get in, you have to start off at 1230 or less. This does not mean you're going to get out of SEAL training. But at least it'll get you into it, so you can get abused and then get thrown out. Um, combat swimmers, about the same. So keep in mind that this subgroup of people, which are the rescue divers and the PSD divers and that type of thing, they're not your asymptomatic general population person. Okay, They have a much higher risk than this. Here's the watermanship test. If anybody has an interest in taking it, we could administer it this afternoon. Um, it's a lot of fun. 500-yard um, swim tread water for 15 minutes, an 800-yard snorkel, free dive, which is just pass, fail. It's an easy one. Just go down, grab a brick, bring it up. And then the 100-yard diver tow, which is the killer, actually. This is just, you know, in scuba gear, pushing somebody through the water. OK, it's uh, not a lot of fun. Full, full scuba gear, both people. You can ditch the weight belt and then push them back and forth, four lengths of the pool. And uh, it's, it's, it's really hard. It's, any turn you want. <laughs> okay. And, uh, but no help from your uh, inert swimmer. So it's, it's, it's a tough one. In our organization, uh, minimum passing is 12 points for a recommendation of somebody to be in a public safety dive team. All public safety scuba instructors have to have 16, uh, be able to reach 16 points. Okay. So you've got to train for this. Well, what does that mean in terms of where, where we get 13 METs? Right, that just sort of popped out of nowhere. Well, not really. <clears throat> if you look at swimming speed and if you look at oxygen consumption, whether you're looking at um, VO2 max or if you're looking at METs, either way, depending on which part of the graph you want to look at, it puts you right there at around the 13 METs level. Okay. So that's about where you are in terms of either your VO2 max, your oxygen consumption, or the METs. Either way, the workload is about the same. So you have a VO2 consumption of about 35 to 40. Okay. You know, anybody has any numbers off their hand about VO2 max? Okay. So to, to get into the U.S. rowing team camp, you need 65. Lance Armstrong in his peak was around 85 to 90. There's one Norwegian skier once who hit 99, okay? So once you get above that 35, 40 range, you're getting into somebody who probably is training a fair amount. So principles of risk reduction, how do we tell ourselves? What do we tell our patients? Um, number one of which is uh, we know that exercise needs to be habitual. We need to worry about our blood pressure control, weight control, and inflammation control. Who out there is taking their fish oil every day? Please show me more hands. OK, need to see everybody. Guys that, guys and gals, that's very important. Take your omega-3s. Um, smoking, we don't need to talk about. Refined sugars. God, I love the Ritz. The Ritz is a wonderful place. They're trying to kill us over there with those pecan pies, which I had too. So refined sugars is not what you should be doing, although it's easier said than done. But what that does is that habitual exercise upregulates our nitric oxide production. And that is what keeps you safe from a cardiovascular point of view. So if you have no other, if you take home no other message from this talk, habitual exercise, 
raises your nitric oxide level. Can you do that? Can you remember that for me? Because that's the one message I want to send home. What does that mean? OK. Got to exercise a little bit, OK? You got to get a little uncomfortable. You got to get out there. You got to work a little bit. You really don't have to barf, but you, you probably should try to do some work. So our medical guidelines are, and we got pushed back, but we finally got acceptance to it. And it's not as stringent as the military, but it's pushing that. Um, <clears throat> every two years over the age of 40, once you reach age 55, you get a yearly cardiac exam. Um, <clears throat> over the age 40, you're doing lipid profiles. Over the age 60, you're getting a cardiac stress test yearly if you plan to participate in vigorous diving. Suggested steps, all of you know all of that, okay? That's just the common sense stuff. Um, but the real question was, is it important to do testing and stress testing and lab testing and exam? The answer is yes, okay? So again, not general population. You're looking at a different group. of So those of you who are divers, you're not the general population. So what do we do? Remember, regulator performance. You don't want to have to work too hard for your breathing. Mindful training, both dive training and exercise training. Try and make it high quality. Aggressive screen. Framing hand is free. All you got to do is get online. Uh, mandated conditioning standards for our divers. And uh, mandated risk education, which I suppose this is what this is. So what's the number one killer? Cardiac disease. What's the best predictor of cardiac health? Exercise capacity. And finally, what's the essential component, the essential component of cardiovascular health for all of you? Exercise. OK. More than anything else, exercise every day. Thank you very much. Any questions I can answer?